briefly introduce you, Marco, but uh, well, Marco uh, is a, a very well-known uh, researcher in AI. He's a professor of computer science at the University of Siena and also uh, holds a chair at the University uh, Cote d'Azur uh, in Nice. Uh, and uh, I think I can definitely say that he was one of the pioneers of, uh, well, this uh, even deep learning revolution and uh, one of the Italian godfather of uh, postmodern AI. This is uh, I want to, um, to, to call it. But uh, yeah, he's a, a very experienced uh, researcher and professor in this area. And we are really delighted to hear about uh, his talks uh, on collectionless AI. So without further ado, uh, thank you again, Marco, for uh, your time. Uh, uh, this is incredibly valuable. And uh, please, uh, the stage is yours. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, of course, I'm I'm really honored to be here. Uh, so this is the first uh, uh, conference on this field. So it's really a pleasure for me to uh, share my uh, my view on, on you know on a topic uh, that I think could be is likely to be to intersect the interest uh, of many of the participants because we are in a community, the one on continual learning where. Uh, the topic I'm presenting uh, can can be of, of some interest. Of course, as I said previously, um, you know the content on what I'm going to propose is really preliminary, but there's some uh, you know some part of my presentation which uh, you know doesn't really uh, involve uh, what what is my own uh, scientific proposal. It, it's a it's a general message that could be you know of uh, of more. Uh, yeah, could be of, of broader interest. So um, I'm talking about collectionless AI, right? So I'll do my best to define this term as soon as possible. And essentially, you know, my talk, in my talk, you, you will see today, uh, there is a distinction because in, in the first part, I will describe briefly uh, what, uh, uh, you know, what is uh, the meaning of collectionless AI in my understanding. And uh, in the second part, I, I will simply you know propose a, a preliminary way of uh, covering uh, you know the, the, the this topic of uh, of collection let's say AI but it is simply you know an interpretation is simply a preliminary view and uh, you know uh, there could be many many different paths for uh, facing uh, what I call collection let's say AI. Uh, so let me uh, go immediately to the topic. I, I think, you know, in the recent discussion on slowdown in AI, um, there are a number of uh, interesting positions, right, uh, from, you know, top level scientists. I'm, I'm here, you know, putting the uh, likely the, the people, the three people who are more uh, popular in, uh, in, in machine learning and in the overall field of artificial intelligence. And as you likely know, there is actually no agreement about you know what could be uh, the uh, at the end uh, you know the the effect uh, on the meaning of slowdown in artificial intelligence. There are controversial positions, very interesting positions from you know from both sides. But there is something that I think uh, you know is uh, 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 well really uh, critical and uh, where probably uh, we could reach uh, more agreement. Right. And uh, uh, many years ago, uh, um, I was stimulated by a colleague of mine, uh, Professor uh, Jan Witten, uh, to cover together with uh, another colleague, Teresa Numerico, um, something that at that time, you know, we found really important. Uh, and basically, the, the idea that, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, search engines uh, uh, after the the dawn uh, of the web, after the explosion of the web, were essentially collecting the the treasure, right? Uh, they were a sort of dragons, right? Uh, but at the same time, they were offering fantastic services, right? So it looks like uh, you had already at that time a sort of double phase of those company, right? Because uh, they are offering uh, great services, and I'm confident uh, um, nobody in this room uh, 
would uh, you know would be happy uh, uh, to not to use uh, those wonderful services anymore but at the same time you know it's important to realize that they are essentially handling the information uh, of uh, uh, you know of, of our of all they have right so it's really critical uh, to some extent so uh, we are talking about big collections and now with generative AI, with large language models, uh, in addition to the possibility of distributing information, right, in a very effective way, there is something more, right? They can generate and, um, well, I'm confident uh, it will be very hard for uh, university uh, research center to compete with top level research centers in those companies, simply because they have an important advantage. They can call, they can access to large data collections. So, uh, what about you know trying to uh, think of artificial intelligence in a different way? Uh, in this slide, uh, you can see a sort of summary of uh, most important topics in machine learning. Sorry, in artificial intelligence, uh, according to the classification of the popular textbook by Nordic Russell, right? So as you can see the topics, I clustered the topics in uh, uh, yeah, in green and pink, and you see on top uh, those topics uh, that you can find you know, as chapters uh, uh, of the book. Uh, you know, the green topic uh, are based on, on methodologies that do not use, right? In no way uh, do not use uh, data, uh, at least uh, large collection of data, right? Uh, they can use large collection of knowledge, uh, um, you know, basis of knowledge, not data, right? Uh, and essentially, if you look at problem solving, planning, you know, knowledge and reasoning, so they are topics where the emphasis of data is not so important. The emphasis of data is important in machine learning. And now, uh, it's really interesting if you look at the history of, of AI, you can easily realize that uh, only after the explosion of machine learning, we have seen this remarkable difference. But now the question, the natural question could be, do we really need large collection of data for learning? We do need data, but not necessarily large collections. We need to access information but not necessarily to have uh, the, uh, you know, a storing of the information, storage of the information. And so the, the question in this slide is whether or not we could somehow unify, you know, the field of, a, uh, of artificial intelligence and come up with, uh, you know, learning methodologies. We continuously learn from data, but do not necessarily access uh, big collections, right? Because uh, you know, while talking now, uh, of course, I'm I'm just uh, producing speech that can be you know uh, uh, elaborated, but you don't necessarily in your brain have a copy uh, of the signal uh, that I'm producing. So that's the challenge, okay? Um, and um, so, for example, look at. Uh, what uh, could be a, a very concise description of the challenge. This is the traditional picture that you can find in, uh, in Nordic Russell book. You have the intelligent agent. What if, you know, all the tasks come from environmental interactions, right? Only environmental interactions, which means any kind of interaction. You can, of course, acquire data you may, uh, you know, interact with people. You always can model this inter interaction by, you know, the acquisition of data, but you do not uh, store. You don't have the permission storing this data, okay? So that's the challenge. Essentially, if you look at, for example, you know, the uh, a possible view of, uh, you know, what is happening nowadays, from one side, uh, you have big data, right? So you can assume that uh, you process big collections. And from the other side, you try, you do your best to assume that at the end of the day, the protagonist of learning is time, 
because you know you can continuously collect information and this is very natural for you know notions like causality because you know time is exactly you know the uh, the variable which is responsible for the emergence of causality and essentially uh, while going towards this direction uh, also from a technological point of view you candidate yourself to produce computational models with a higher degree of autonomy so uh, uh, one question you know that you can pose yourself is whether you know uh, it could be the case that uh, you know, uh, you have uh, already something in the literature which, uh, you know, correspond to this view, right? For example, recurrent neural networks, uh, they process time already. They collect the information, right? And process the information uh, as uh, sequences. So the question could be, uh, we already probably already have the methodologies for processing the information in this way but if you carefully analyze you know how things are, are been working it is not the case uh, you actually uh, access uh, large collections for learning with recurrent neural networks so, sorry so, marco sorry right. to interrupt we we don't see the these lights anymore we see a black screen oh. ah i don't know why now oh. it appeared uh, ah now we can now we can now you see yes Thanks. Okay, simply because I was uh, using my play in Keynote. Uh, <laughs> it looks yeah. like I, that's interesting. Okay, so uh, just to tell you that, uh, well, with recurrent neural networks, uh, uh, it could be an example, right? But different fields in machine learning, for example, reinforcement learning, right? It's a typical field where you uh, essentially uh, promote the interactions with the environment. But uh, in any case, uh, we typically work in a context where uh, we uh, simulate everything, right? Uh, so um, now, you know, the, the second part of uh, my talk is, uh, you know, on, on a few ideas that um, I'm, I'm, I'm planning to circulate in this talk, right? But before I, I start to talking about, you know, uh, my uh, proposal, uh, I'm simply stating that uh, collectionless AI, you know, means can I essentially introduce in addition to the classical topics of artificial intelligence, which are mostly topics in symbolic AI? Could, could is, it, is it also the case that uh, machine learning uh, is still a discipline where we can essentially, you know, construct a theory that don't uh, doesn't really need to, uh, you know, rely on statistics, on big collection of data, but can simply process the information, right, when the information comes, just, uh, you know, as it happens in nature, right? Because as I was mentioning, in the human brain, but, uh, you know, in, in regardless of the human uh, brain, right, any, uh, you know, in, in nature, you don't have such a storage of information. You have the wonderful capability of compressing the information and to provide a sort of abstraction once the information comes. So not uh, essentially uh, because uh, you are processing your data by using a database. So uh, I will uh, sketch uh, the, in a few slides, you know, the the basic idea and the basic idea is that uh, you know uh, i'm promoting time uh, in order to understand uh, what could be the a possibility so it's just a proposal right it's a, and the proposal here is that of thinking of machine learning in a in a different way you start to think about you know uh, information which comes continuously right exactly like in nature uh, i call this framework hamiltonian learning for reasons that you will see uh, in in the next few slides. So um, so let me let me go quickly to uh, you know some uh, yeah uh, okay. So for example, uh, this is a classical case in which you can easily see what is the meaning of processing the information uh, in conjunction with time. 
especially for people coming from the community of computer vision, uh, they likely know uh, immediately uh, this formula here, right? So the typical brightness in various condition, which means that uh, if I want to calculate, for example, the optical flow, I can simply see, you know, I can simply impose uh, this invariant property. And this invariant property is a property which, uh, you know, is uh, dictated by time. At the end of the day, you know, uh, this is a, a differential equation which, uh, you know, imposes the invariance, right? Um, something similar, you know, could be done if you, your ambition is to develop fixtures in computer vision where you want to promote uh, the invariance of these fixtures with respect to motion, right? So you have to think of consistent decisions uh, and consistency takes place with time, right? Because as time goes by, you need to have consistent decisions, right? So, uh, you know, there are so many uh, cases where uh, you can uh, think of a natural protocol learning where you have a sort of transition, right? You have a transition from, you know, from loss to Lagrangian, okay? So what is the meaning of this transition? The meaning is that, uh, you know, you can easily see in this, uh, in this slide, okay? So uh, if you open any uh, textbook of machine learning, one of the typical equation that you find, you know, is the typical formula describing the functional risk, okay? Uh, the typical, you know, uh, statistical term that you use uh, that you typically approximate with the empirical risk, okay? So essentially, uh, you assume your dream uh, in statistics is that you can access, uh, you can have the probability distribution, right? And you can access the probability distribution if you really have a big collection of data, right? And so that's the dream of uh, statisticians, right? And that's what, uh, you know, happened in machine learning. Uh, at the end, uh, the, the bigger the collection, right? And the better it is uh, for uh, the technology that we have. But now, uh, suppose that instead of having this, uh, you know, this risk, right? Uh, which at the end becomes a sort of empirical risk because you have collections, right, of data. Suppose that uh, you transfer uh, from, a, from a technical point of view, this measure, uh, which is uh, an ensemble measure, so the integral over the joint uh, distribution of the variables with the integral over time. It means that uh, you essentially collect the information as time goes by continuously, right? And the average, you know, uh, is more or less the same concept. So you, you, you have something similar, you have a risk, but this time, you know, the averaging uh, is computed just by collecting all the information during the life of the agent. So you can start thinking about a life, right? Because you can continuously collect information. And this is interesting, right? Because, uh, you know, when thinking about uh, uh, generative AI and what we have recently seen, uh, clearly uh, the, the benefit uh, of having big collections is quite clear. But now, suppose that you have a different approach where instead of, you know, uh, organizing yourself from a technological point of view with the purpose of constructing really big collection of data, you do something different. You start acquiring information continuously, right? So uh, by using smartphones, but any sensor in principle, right? We have a, a, an unbelievable number of sensors, you know, all around the world. And so they can essentially uh, collect the information and process the information immediately, right? And then you can uh, essentially measure uh, from a technical point of view by accumulating, you know, these uh, errors. Uh, so from a mathematical point of view, the only difference is that uh, you have a, an integral over time, okay? So uh, uh, essentially, uh, you can think of something like this, right? This could be a neural network, right? If you look at this equation uh, with the derivative of time, uh, this is a, a typical recurrent neural network. So I'm, I'm using the mathematics of continuous because, you know, it, it's more straightforward. But of course, there is a, a counterpart which comes from discretization, right? Uh, whenever you are interested in uh, simulating what happens. 
but the essence uh, is the same, right? So you have a computational model, the purpose of which is processing the information over time, okay? And then you are given a functional risk. So you see, this is essentially the functional risk uh, because the average is over time. And at the end, you know, if you try to state the problem of learning, it, it is es essentially the same. This time you have to determine uh, the argument of the minimum of this new functional risk. Clearly, uh, this is a sort of dream, right? Because uh, you are thinking about an horizon, which could be the horizon of life of a certain agent, okay? And you want to minimize, you know, this index over he, his life, okay? And in principle, you know, it could be uh, the lifespan could be infinite, right? So you could think of uh, the formulation of this problem uh, as we normally do in calculus. So you, you, you have, a, you know, a completely uh, uh, different way, right, of uh, interpreting the learning process because uh, you know since the very beginning that the problem is this one, right? Uh, so you are given essentially uh, what is in variational calculus is uh, called a functional and, and you need to uh, determine the minimum. So just a few things concerning this problem, right? Uh, here you can see exactly the replacement, right? So at the end, what is called loss function becomes the Lagrangian. Uh, this is what you know is uh, very well known in uh, in calculus by mathematicians and especially you know in theoretical physics. You know uh, people used to play with Lagrangians, right? So the Lagrangian now is essentially a loss function, okay? And uh, uh, another popular term which is used in you know in uh, uh, by uh, in theoretical physics, but especially, for example, in the community of optimal control, is the notion of cost to go or value function, right? So what is the cost uh, which is remaining? The cost to go from time small t to big T, okay? And so just to tell you that uh, we are likely opening a new uh, door where essentially time becomes the protagonist, right? So, for example, uh, you know, we have something similar in, in physics, and there is something that uh, I uh, very much like. I, you know, reuse the classical, you know, figures from, from uh, famous lectures, you know, because uh, I found, uh, you know, very elegant the presentation, you know, old presentation, yet very elegant. Essentially, you know, what you do, for example, in, in physics and in many, you know, field of physics, you have a, the, the popular notion of action, right? So, for example, one intriguing thing is that uh, the laws of physics, and, and particularly in this case, the laws of mechanics, uh, can be derived once you determine the stationarity of the action. Normally, you know, in physics, people used to say the minimum, and we are talking about least action. Uh, it is essentially a stationarity, it's not exactly a minimum, uh, but this is, you know, a technical point that I, uh, I don't want to focus uh, at this time. But interestingly enough, you have a sort of gradient, uh, you know, it's a different methodology uh, because uh, you use the Euler-Lagrange equations, but it's more or less the same thing. So the Newtonian equations, right, uh, is just the outcome of, uh, uh, you know, the stationarity of the action. And this is, you know, quite interesting because uh, you can think of machine learning and you could say, what about, you know, our system, right? We, we are given neurons, right? And then we are given weights and the weights, they change. So essentially we can think of something similar. We have, uh, you know, coordinates, Lagrangian coordinates, just like in theoretical physics. And we have uh, an interesting association of concepts. So just to be, you know, more precise. Uh, yeah, uh, I will tell you something about, you know, first of all, why I feel this could be important. And in order to stress the importance of time, uh, I want to show you this slide. Uh, many years ago, uh, Francis Crick, uh, that is, uh, you likely know, is, uh, you know, a uh, Nobel Prize uh, for DNA, right? Uh, wrote a very nice paper on uh, nature, uh, and he was making comments on, uh, you know, back propagation and this excitement uh, on connectionist models. One interesting thing was, uh, 
he uh, was making a comment on the biological plausibility of backpropagation. And, uh, you know, this topic uh, uh, is still on the table. We have seen a lot of papers, a lot of discussions about the plausibility. And, you know, most people is believing that uh, it is not a plausible uh, algorithm from a biological point of view. But I can tell you something more, right? This is the typical equation of the neuron, right? Uh, so uh, look carefully at this equation. You don't see time here, right? Because you, you assume that as soon as you feed the neuron, you have an immediate response of the output, right? So the velocity of the signal, if you look at from a physical point of view, the velocity of the signal is infinite, right? So there is no time here. There is a beautiful algorithm, algorithmic framework, but there is no time, okay? So uh, there is no physical plausibility of uh, this kind of neural networks. Uh, so it's not just a matter of biological uh, plausibility. Even before, there is no physical plausibility. But then you can think of something interesting, right? So look at this picture, right? This is a typical picture in which you are given a pattern, then you have the supervisor, and you want to see what happens, for example, in this, uh, let's say, deep network, uh, when you uh, perform back propagation. One interesting possibility of understanding more about what could be the role of time is that of assuming that you have a sort of delay, right? And so essentially you could have a sort of forward propagation of the information. So you see the, the blue arrow, okay? Which is a sort of wave if you have delay in the neurons. And you can think also of a sort of uh, backward wave, which come from the you know back propagation of the error. And interestingly enough, if you uh, have this intuition, you can realize that, you know, when you look at these uh, neurons, you know, after a while, there are neurons which get uh, both the information from these converging waves, which means that uh, you can think of a sort of local computation, right? Something which, uh, you know, uh, is not possible in uh, backpropagation simply because you don't have time, okay? You don't involve time in the computation. So why this is important? This is important because the actual formulation of learning, uh, uh, if you really want to promote time, should be completely different. Essentially, if you want to minimize, for example, the value function, which at the end uh, you know, is the objective uh, of learning, uh, once you promote this temporal direction, at the end of the day, uh, well, it's, uh, it's a different problem, right? And uh, uh, what is nice is that uh, there is a lot of mathematics which has uh, already been developed, uh, and especially you know, in the field of theoretical physics, this, this is really extremely clear. There is nothing to invent. So for example, there are, uh, the, the, so the popular Hamiltonian uh, Jacobi Bellman equations, uh, uh, which already solve the optimization problem. So the learning problem is, in a sense, from a mathematical point of view, you know, is already uh, described, uh, can, can already be described by mathemati a mathematical formulation, right? Uh, uh, we will see what is the problem. It's so nice you know, to uh, import uh, this framework in machine learning, right? Uh, because uh, we already have the solution. And I can tell you that uh, from people coming from computer science, you know, these are questions, uh, uh, the, the basic philosophy is essentially the philosophy of dynamic programming. So nothing so strange, right? So it's more or less the philosophy that you adopt when you uh, use the Dijkstra algorithm, right? So you, you still have uh, the principle of dynamic programming behind. And we will see that this is extremely important when you, you know, we will try to understand what happens in machine learning. Oh, uh, so uh, the Hamilton-Jacobi equations, you know, are complex equations from a computational point of view because they are partial differential equations uh, which involve, uh, you know, time and uh, the variable of learning. And essentially, uh, there is no possibility from a computational point of view of solving these problems, right? So they are beautiful equations. You look at them and you say, okay, uh, they are nice, but uh, they are useless. And uh, it, there is something more. Uh, if you try to invoke the natural perspective, in nature, you have solutions. In a sense, the law of physics, right, comes from optimization. 
we were talking about the action, right? So there should be something different. Well, is uh, you know, I think it's pretty easy to answer this question because we already have in uh, in mathematics and in theoretical physics a solution to this problem because uh, we know that uh, this uh, general uh, formulation from dynamic programming is equivalent to Hamiltonian equations. And now I can tell you that, uh, you know, the Hamiltonian equation are differential equation, which means that they can easily, you know, be uh, in core computed with computational models like recurrent neural networks, for example, right? So we use this term in machine learning, but the essence is the same. Um, what is important to know is that, uh, uh, yeah, so this can be done, you know, and uh, uh, there is an interpretation also, which is very nice in uh, machine learning, because as soon as you try to uh, uh, combine, you know, this methodology with machine learning, you have the emergence of a parameter, which is called cost state, uh, but is also a Lagrangian multiplier. So the interesting thing is that, uh, you know, uh, there is a, the emergence in learning of a new parameter. And, and this new parameter, at the end of the day, uh, you know, is not so strange because it can be proven that uh, it corresponds somehow to the delta error of back propagation. So we will see in the next few minutes. What we know from, you know, from the, the mathematical description is that we have to solve a boundary problem. This is, a, this is extremely important, right? And it makes sense because you don't know what kind of information will come in the future, right? And it, it is uh, inherently connected to the problem of learning. Uh, you try to do something at a certain time, but you don't know what will happen next, right? The actual optimization can only be gained if you offer the boundary condition. So also the value of this variable, which is called cost state, or can be interpreted as a Lagrangian multiplier. Now, uh, what I can tell you is that, uh, uh, you know, let me let me show quickly, you know, uh, something, and especially what happens, for example, uh, if you use this theory for recurrent neural networks, right? So what you have to do is that you are simply patient enough to, you know, look at the uh, at the theory and simply, you know, uh, uh, make the computation, right? And le let me show how the uh, Hamiltonian equations, uh, right, are translated once you use this theory in recurrent neural networks. Well, if you look at these equations, uh, um, you can easily see that uh, these are equations that are quite familiar uh, in machine learning. So for example, this is the model of the recurrent neural network, right? So I'm, I'm assuming here, uh, I'm using the Einstein notation. So essentially the, uh, you know, the indices uh, which are not repeated um, on, the right, uh, on the right uh, side of the equation, you know, that there is a sum for this index, right? So you have the sum over P and this is the typical uh, neural output, right? And he, this is the derivative. So essentially, this is the classical uh, recurrent neural network model. Um, I'm using this uh, additional trick of uh, considering the velocity of change of the, of the connections. And now, what is uh, quite surprising, and it was quite surprising to me, is that uh, you end up uh, into equations where, if you look at the equation for P, uh, the equation for P is essentially a generalization of backpropagation. Uh, if you look at this term, right, and here is a sum over the, uh, uh, you know, over the children, right, of uh, the generic node. And essentially what you can see is that you can calculate this parameter, which in, in backpropagation is the delta error, directly by looking at the parents and the children. Right, so it is not like in back propagation that you need to perform the forward step and then the backward step and accumulate in memory. You can compute directly uh, in a local way. You know, you have the pleasure of uh, looking at the parents of the children, and you can write down uh, local equations. So this is the difference. Just just to give you an idea, you know, this is a, a typical you know uh, structure of the computation of, of uh, you know, in this framework. So you have a loop over time, okay, which is, uh, you know, the uh, the life of the agent. This is the find, uh, you know, uh, 
the, the lifespan. Then you have a loop over the neurons. Please consider that uh, you may have any connection here, right? So you are given a graph, not necessarily a directed graph, but you may have cycles, uh, which you know is called recurrent neural networks in machine learning. And then, uh, you know, if you look, for example, at this equation, you can easily recognize the typical, you know, the propagation, back propagation, right? So uh, you end up into something which, uh, you know, seems to be uh, really very similar with respect to what happens in, uh, uh, in uh, the neural networks that don't play with time. So we essentially have a generalization of backpropagation, which uh, uh, incorporate perfectly the temporal dimension, right? So it looks like uh, uh, all these things, you know, uh, seems to be very uh, simple. There is something I want just to quickly show you, uh, which is uh, actually a very important problem uh, for all people who, um, you know, uh, is a bit familiar with this topic and is uh, the following intriguing thing, right? Uh, we can easily see that uh, if you go forward, uh, okay, so you have a neural network which process the information forward in time, uh, there is a, an, an interesting problem, right? There is instability uh, of the learning process. And all people who are familiar with neural networks and especially, not, I would say, recurrent neural networks know that in principle, you may have instability uh, in, the, in, in, in the learning process. And so, uh, you know, what we did is that we adopted a solution that uh, I don't have time now to describe, but I would be happy to, the, to discuss with you, uh, which make it possible to stay in a sort of Hamiltonian track, uh, because, uh, you know, this is quite a, a complex problem. So we did you know, just a few preliminary experiments, you know, to understand, you know, how things uh, have been working, for example, in, in tracking, in problem of uh, tracking in optimal control. And we can see, you know, what happens uh, when you change uh, the accuracy, uh, you can see a small, uh, yeah, uh, decrement uh, of the error. You can see, you know, what happens when you try to approximate. You see the green is the target uh, and the blue is the output. You try to uh, uh, to fit the data. Uh, and I also put this plot just to show that, uh, you know, this methodology uh, essentially is a methodology where um, you try in order to understand what's going on. It's very important to plot, uh, for example, not only the Lagrangian, but especially the Hamiltonian, because the Hamiltonian function is a, has to do with the interaction with the environment. It's a sort of uh, description of the uh, energy uh, uh, of uh, the system, right? Because uh, during learning, you have a sort of dissipation of energy. And you see the plot, uh, you know, the, the green here is the plot of the Hamiltonian. So uh, it's interesting to see that there are points in which uh, 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 th there is this uh, additional interaction with the environment. So just to draw a few conclusions, um, I did my best to convince you that uh, um, there is potentially uh, the possibility for the years to come of uh, uh, taking the picture of uh, the Nordic Russell uh, textbook uh, where you have symbolic uh, AI, uh, which is based uh, on methodology that do not uh, use large collection of data and machine learning, which on the opposite uh, do rely on big collections. And maybe we can unify uh, the theory because it could be the case that intelligent processes do not require the access to big collection. They do require the uh, access to data. They need to create a memory an internal representation, an internal abstract representation of, of what you process without uh, recording data. And that could be extremely important, you know, for the years to come. If we want to construct, uh, you know, methodologies and theory uh, that could be in principle better, especially from the privacy point of view, right? It could dramatically change, you know, all discussions concerning privacy, we could assume that, uh, uh, you know, privacy uh, is uh, 
uh, somehow solved by design because uh, you don't collect data, right? It's, it's just like, you know, in nature, we access information, but we don't take pictures. We don't, uh, you know, have a perfect transcription of voice signal or images. And then in the second part of the talk, I simply, you know, offered my humble uh, intuition about what could be a possible direction uh, for attacking this problem. Please bear in mind that, uh, you know, uh, what I briefly presented is based on the mathematics, uh, you know, continuous mathematics, but uh, there is exactly a parallel direction where we can use discrete mathematics. Uh, and this is, of course, extremely important because suppose you want to, uh, uh, your ambition is to work on language. Of course, you, you are given tokens in this case, right? And they are discrete. So uh, you need to use methodologies where uh, what I presented, you know, is not correct, right? Because it, it is essentially assuming that you are given a function, right? But what is nice is that there is, in fact, a parallel uh, mathematical framework also for facing uh, this problem. And final comment is that uh, one of the things that I find, uh, let's say, more interesting uh, in, in this uh, uh, study, at least uh, from you know, my point of view, for years and years, you know, um, I was looking for methodology, uh, the purpose of which was to uh, have a, a spatial temporal locality in, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the update of the weights, right? And yeah, I, I think you know, th this is essentially a natural solution. And it and comes directly uh, from, from it's, it's a sort of translation of the Hamiltonian equations. Thank you so much for, uh, for your attention. Thank you, Marco. Thank you for your great talk. Uh, and to bring us uh, to, our, to our attention, this idea of collectionless AI and uh, some interesting ideas uh, uh, on how we can actually try to, to get there. Uh, so uh, we have uh, um, the opportunity now to ask Marco some questions. So uh, you are invited to uh, raise your hand if you want to speak directly. We give you the opportunity to speak uh, through your mic. Or uh, you can uh, open your Q&A tab and uh, ask a question there. So I think we can start from the question that Antonio Carta uh, has been uh, uh, writing has been voted by other people. So uh, what is, uh, Marco, the relationship between collectionless AI, how you have defined it, and online learning, uh, in your opinion? Uh, in online learning, we also learn one example at a time, uh, for example. So uh, Antonio, who is uh, actually uh, also quite experienced in uh, uh, well, continual learning, online learning, and uh, um, sequence learning. So I think uh, he was interested also in those uh, uh, this ambiguation about those aspects. So what do you think, Marco? What's the relationship? What the, the uniqueness uh, or or uh, similarities with uh, with those aspects? Uh, we are you're muted, Marco. Thank yeah, you. thanks. Thanks. It's a fundamental question, I'd say, and probably, you know, it's important because it gave me the opportunity of uh, telling you uh, uh, something more. I'm confident, uh, you know, in, you, you should already, already consider these possibilities, right? So online learning, right, in principle, is exactly the way of uh, implementing a sort of collectionless machine learning, right? Because in principle, you can assume that if you strictly use uh, online learning, you know, uh, all things I was saying uh, are somehow trivial, right? And I think th this is extremely important. But now uh, let's analyze things a little bit more carefully, right? Um, first, online learning is essentially dominating also uh, the kind of solutions that we have nowadays. So we, we may use a mini batches, right? But essentially it's something very similar to online learning. No one is, uh, you know, is so crazy uh, to take uh, those big collection of data and use uh, batch mode, right? So you, we, uh, this is quite clear, right? But 
there is one point that you need to consider very carefully, and is the uh, the underlying assumption that uh, your data collections are typically uh, offered uh, uh, in a random uh, presentation. What I mean is that you process one example after the other, and uh, you know those examples are typically unrelated from a statistical point of view. Interestingly enough, uh, there are a number of studies, and uh, it's interesting to make also experiments uh, to realize that uh, this is crucial, right? So there's even theoretical uh, understanding of uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent uh, and the role of this, uh, you know, statistic distribution. And at the same time, you know, you can see the failure, for example, of uh, using online learning. So the gradient descent approach uh, uh, in the stochastic term, for example, if you process a signal, right? And your samples are strictly related simply because you have a certain behavior of your signal. So you try to, uh, let's say, make predictions, but the problem is that you just learn the last example and you forget everything, right? So this is a, a fundamental topic in continual learning, right? Uh, the, the forgetting of, uh, you know, what happened uh, in the past. So the, the, the issue here is serious, right? Because, uh, uh, you want to learn over time, right? Even in case in which you have such a dependency, right? Because if you look at video, visual information, there is indeed a dependency from one sample, uh, from one you know uh, frame to the other one. And the same is for speech or any perceptual information. So you have a dependency over time and uh, uh, online learning is not exactly uh, adequate for processing in this case, because, uh, you know, the typical outcome is that you forget and you don't learn, right? And so uh, this is just to first as a comment to say that it's not trivial, right? So it's not just, uh, you know, that we can use uh, stochastic gradient descent in a framework in which uh, uh, you impose your agent to be completely autonomous, and this is uh, one of the crucial points in, uh, in the challenge I'm proposing. It's an agent which is autonomous, right? Which collects information continuously. Uh, the agent doesn't enjoy the pre-processing of data that somebody properly organized for him, right? So for example, uh, by having the appropriate uh, uh, statistic uh, uh, independency, right? And so that's the problem. So in, in a few words, the problem is that the stochastic gradient descent uh, works pretty well under some important statistical assumptions that are normally verified in most experiments uh, simply because we enjoy the idea that uh, we are given data collections. It's a different story if your task is to process the information as time, as time you know, goes by. Great. And, and, and Marco, I think, uh, so this idea of collectionless AI also uh, bring us uh, directly into the open discussion we had planned, uh, because it's, I think, uh, well, even can be seen as an alternative of, in opposition with the current centralization aspect of foundational models. So if we look at the program, uh, we we have allocated the, you know, this uh, open discussion right after your talk, as I think it was also quite aligned because it, it's interesting to see how collection, let's say, I can, uh, can also be uh, seen as an alternative or something uh, different from current uh, state-of-the-art approach in AI, which are based on the collection of huge amount of data and then processing everything in a centralized scheme. Uh, but before getting to that, uh, we have another question uh, in uh, the Q&A tab uh, where uh, uh, an, an attendee uh, is uh, essentially saying, in your approach, uh, you know, trying to solve Lagrange or Hamiltonian uh, problems, uh, uh, won't the solution, or I think the computational approach you de develop depend on the efficiency of, uh, you know, solving differential equations? So maybe it's about, you know, the the, comp the computational complexity needed by your approach. Do, do you have some? 
Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, well, please, please consider that uh, you know the uh, the solution of uh, uh, yeah, that, that that's an important question, right? Because if you look at uh, what I uh, was formulating, right? If you formulate the the problem uh, in this way, right, and you say, so what is the optimum, right? The optimum, or oh, let me see. Uh, is a problem where you have boundary conditions and you have to solve the differential equation with boundary condition. That's a terrible problem, essentially, because uh, you know it's really from a complexity point of view. Uh, you know the question makes a lot of sense, and the problem is, uh, uh, let's say, in the framework of machine learning, I think uh, you know there is no hope to formulate a problem uh, in this way. Uh, I was uh, simply, um, you know, ju just mentioning that uh, the way we have been solving the problem is exactly, you know, forward steps, uh, just to use a term which is popular in machine learning, with recurrent network. So essentially, we solve the problem, uh, not the boundary problem, but we start from the initial condition, and from the initial conditions, uh, we update the state, right? So if you look at, for example, you know, these are the differential equation and this is, you know, the code. What is interesting here, if you look at, for example, X dot, right? This is X dot, which is the, the prime derivative, right? And then you have the updating, uh, you know, of, of the state, uh, right? So essentially, what you can see here, you see this is the update of the state, right? Which is uh, based on X dot. You see, this is the Euler approximation. So the simpler approximation you, you have in uh, differential equations. So the, the, from, from a computational point of view is extremely fast, right? Because uh, you process the information continuously, at least if you look at this code, right? So from a computational point of view, uh, this is great because uh, you process the information continuously, right? Uh, as the information comes. What is nice in your question is that uh, you know you may have and uh, you know you may be suspicious about my you know uh, answer concerning the fact that uh, you learn simply by uh, you know solving by processing the information you see here in the loop. You know this is efficient because uh, you have a this range, this is the range on the interval uh, of time, right? So this is time, and this is the neuron, and you update continuously the information. But there is an important problem here, right? Uh, so we don't solve the boundary problem, which is the optimal solution. And, and essentially, you... The, if you want to promote collectionless AI, you don't know the, the boundary. So you have to promote something similar. You have to see whether it's possible you know, to provide an approximation of the theory, the purpose of which is to uh, discover a solution even without knowing the boundary solution. And this is machine learning because in general, this is impossible. So it is impossible in general to solve an optimization problem, you know, in this way, just by uh, taking a portion of the, all uh, the horizon, right? But since the information is somehow related, there is the, what in machine learning we call generalization process. And so the idea is that you can really do something like this, but, uh, you know, I didn't have time to enter uh, this kind of, of details. I, you may remember I presented this slide, you know, and this is the slide which uh, is showing that uh, things are a bit more complicated because during learning, it is the case that, uh, you know, the, 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 the field, uh, you know, goes outside uh, what I call an Hamiltonian track. You know, you risk uh, uh, an unstable process. What is very nice is that uh, if you constrain the learning in this Hamiltonian path, right, uh, then, you know, things uh, uh, can be stabilized and learning take place. But in a few words, uh, sorry, uh, maybe not to uh, uh, provide all the technical details here, but of course, I'll be very happy, you know, uh, to talk with, the, uh, you know, the uh, 
uh, and make uh, the, the details. Uh, the, the idea here is that you need also to stabilize uh, the learning process. And, and from a cognitive point of view, there, there is a very simple meaning behind. The meaning is that at the very beginning of learning, you need to collect information, which is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, you, you need not to be exposed to too many details. You need uh, is what happened, for example, in, in video, in children. Uh, from developmental psychology, we know that at, at the early stage of life in newborn, uh, you know, the, the video is, is somehow blurred, right? And so this is just to facilitate the solution. And it has to do a lot with your question. Uh, the complexity, you know, of uh, the solution of these differential equations, uh, because they are laws of, of nature in somehow, just like in physics, right? And the recurrent neural network from a technological point of view would be something which, you know, process the information uh, at any step. Thank you, Marco, for, for the answer. And uh, so we have still 15 minutes uh, uh, to discuss. Uh, and I see that uh, Albin uh, is already starting his preparations uh, to start with the hands-on tutorial on, on Avalanche next. But so we have 15 minutes, I think, to maybe try to take on Marco uh, some interesting questions about uh, the relationship of collectionless AI with, uh, with these foundational models. Uh, so to kickstart these, uh, these, uh, these thoughts that I, I'm sure you have already, uh, so one thing that I'm really worried about uh, is uh, the analogy also with the web dragons that you also introduced, right? So, so we already went through this process in a sense of uh, understanding that there are limitations uh, due to the research and technology, the mainstream approach to something, especially related to computer science. And uh, what, what I, I've seen, I imagine it is a shared uh, thought, is we, we have not been able to provide a substantial alternative to these web dragons. Uh, and we have been you know, waiting for this for 20 years. And so <laughs> in this analogy with what is happening now with the AI, so do you think that there is a, an hope for collectionless AI? So this idea of developing AI methodologies that uh, leverage data on one hand, as you mentioned, so uh, they are based on the idea of using data, but at the same time, do not collect them. So we will be able, despite the difficulties of doing it uh, uh, with respect to standard centralized approach where you have those collections, so we will be, uh, be able to do it uh, in okay. the future, or we need a strong, uh, let's say, regulation or, uh, let's say, commitment also politically to say, okay, this is how we do things. We are not be waiting for a new approach to be more effective. Uh, what yeah, do you think, yeah. Mark? Yeah, th thanks. Uh, uh, stimulating question. And of course, uh, you know, when trying to answer this question, uh, I think one of the uh, important thing to bear in mind is that, uh, uh, you know, uh, I can at most express uh, a technical opinion. And we know very well, you know, how technical opinion uh, after, you know, time, uh, you know, the kind of color they assume, right? So yeah. technical <laughs> opinion can be definitely... Uh, you know, um, well, no, pulls at the end, right? You 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 take a thesis and then it doesn't really. And I can tell you more, right? When we wrote this book, uh, the book uh, uh, was a book for you know the layman, right? So people, yeah. uh, for scientists, and our intention was to actually you know spread the idea that uh, you know uh, people should be a bit more careful about, you know, the spread of information and the collection of information in uh, those repositories, right? Yeah. And, the, and the word dragon was just perfect because it, as I was mentioning, from one side, you have the face of the dragon, uh, which is the typical face of Western countries. But mm. in Eastern countries, you know, dragon at the same time means something wonderful which offers yeah. a lot of importance, yeah. right? And it, it is, uh, the metaphor, you know, seems to be appropriate, right? But uh, so at that time, uh, we were thinking that uh, the book uh, could have, uh, uh, you know, appropriate and maybe the impact, uh, uh, we were thinking of the impact. So the impact was nearly zero, 
right? And so it's interesting, right? And now we, you ask me a technical opinion, and so uh, it's just to warn old people, you know, who are listening that uh, I'll, uh, uh, this is my second guess, you know, in my first guess, uh, the impact was zero, okay? Uh, but again, uh, uh, I am I'm, I'm pleased you know, to answer you, your question because I have the feeling that uh, after the explosion of a generative AI, you know, yeah. this discussion, for example, of slowdown of artificial intelligence. Yeah, it's quite new. From, yeah, it's quite new, right? We didn't, you know, have this kind of discussion earlier, right? And uh, as I was claiming, uh, the role of uh, these large collections is really important, right? So, of course, the benefit from using the services of those companies is impressive, you know, in medicine, in science, uh, in, in any field, right? And, and, you know, for many things. But uh, if you, you want my guess, and since uh, this is recorded, you know, it's so nice, <laughs> my guess is that sooner or later, you know, we will have a collectionless machine learning. And of course, I would be just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, absolutely ridiculous if I could say that uh, what I'm proposing in the second part of my talk, you know, is revolutionary, is something which, uh, of course, uh, it doesn't make any sense because it's just a very preliminary, you know, understanding, a uh, preliminary intuition. But my understanding on the long run is that uh, regardless of what I proposed today, right, the idea that uh, sooner or later, you know, the technologies of machine learning and artificial intelligence will be somehow unified in that respect, uh, and that uh, it will be possible also, you know, to exhibit, uh, uh, you know, intelligent agents capable of uh, acquiring these capabilities without accessing yeah. Uh, the big collections, at least uh, not in the massive way that we are doing. Of course, in no way I'm believing that uh, these will uh, reverse completely what we have nowadays, yeah. because uh, we have a lot of benefits uh, also, you know, from these companies. But you are talking about regulations uh, from, uh, you know, governments. It could be yeah. the case that there will be more attention on what it means, you know, yeah. to collect data. And uh, so just to say that uh, there is a good chance that uh, this is uh, an alternative path for machine learning. And uh, uh, I'm really honored to be here to, to say uh, something like this in the community of scientists uh, who are likely uh, the one who are more uh, uh, sensible and yeah. probably also uh, with more more stimulus scientific uh, stimulus uh, stimulus for you know attacking this problem uh, because you know regardless of the specific uh, proposal I'm doing I feel that uh, sooner or later you know we'll have also a technological impact right because it means that you move the technology from cloud computing you know to uh, you know thin clients. So from a technological point of view, it's a huge impact. And of course, regardless of the technological point of view, uh, uh, I like uh, the game, right? Uh, I really like the game of thinking that uh, there is a, an alternative path and it, it is already happening in nature. So uh, I don't believe that, uh, that there is some, uh, you know, uh, special reason why, uh, you know, this is a, these are laws from biology. I feel that they are laws from information. And then we are far away from understanding what could be the appropriate approach. Only one comment uh, concerning what I'm proposing is what I call the pre-algorithmic step. Mm. When I say pre-algorithmic uh, uh, step, I'm referring to um, a, an approach where uh, before thinking of uh, what could be an algorithm in a computer, it could be also interesting to see uh, whether uh, you know, this process of learning is uh, similar to what happens in other uh, domains, right? Uh, where, mm. you know, you have something which is regulated by laws, right? And so uh, 
the pre-algorithmic approach uh, promotes some way, in some way, you know, a different way of thinking, which then later on integrate perfectly also with algorithms. That's uh, fantastic, uh, Marco. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, these discussions uh, really helps us, I mean, as a community to, to understand better what you are doing. I totally with you also with this uh, uh, idea that uh, I think this audience uh, and this uh, continual learning, uh, lifelong learning uh, uh, collection of people is indeed uh, the most sensible to these topics. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, I'm really proud to be part let's say, of this committee. I, I figure myself as being part of those. So uh, thank you so much for your kind words as well. And uh, I think we are getting down now to the next session. So uh, I ask everyone here uh, connected if they have some additional questions uh, they want to interact with, uh, with Marco. Uh, we have still five minutes and you can see already Albin is uh, setting his, uh, his camera. Hi Albin, uh, nice to see you. And uh, Hi. fantastic, okay, you can speak as well. And uh, I'll uh, then leave you uh, in the expert ends of Julio, I think, uh, is the session chair that will be end, uh, uh, say, handling the next couple of sessions before the break. Uh, so we have uh, Alvin and then uh, a paper contributed talk, a pre-registration uh, papers uh, session. So stay with us. And then we have a break uh, after uh, those couple of, uh, uh, of, of sessions. Um, I don't see any more questions or uh, raised hands uh, in the chat. So I think Marco, you, you were clear enough. And uh, of course, if the people are interested in, in what Marco is doing, uh, uh, I guess Marco would be more than yeah, happy to, course, to answer that to, to some specific queries. Or uh, uh, I think uh, you also have, Marco, some um, some references uh, maybe in your uh, uh, in your papers about all these, uh, these yeah, ideas. Well, no? uh, well, maybe just uh, in case somebody wants to have a look. Well, uh, yeah, this book Fantastic. has been recently um, published, and in this book uh, there is uh, you know something which is uh, somehow uh, in the direction of what I, I was saying. Uh, deep learning to see is uh, contain uh, you know uh, so ideas that uh, are definitely aligned with what I presented today. And for all of you who want to uh, also uh, read something on uh, uh, yeah on what we have been doing, we just recently uh, released uh, a, a brief paper on the idea of collectionless AI. So ah, you, can easily find it, you can easily find it, uh, uh, you know, on archive, uh, just by, uh, uh, yeah, by typing in uh, collectionless AI, I think you can easily find it. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Marco, again, for your time. Uh, I stole more than uh, two hours <laughs> for your time. Um, and uh, I'm really glad we could, uh, we could also discuss some, uh, some ideas at intersectional collection, let's say, eyes and other topics. So uh, without further ado, I will then move to the next session handled by Julio as a session chair and uh, with Albing as a speaker. Thank you so much. Thanks.